Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is March 29, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 44. It has now been 15 months since I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 that a new Bolshevik revolution was getting underway here in the United States. Last month I revealed that a Bolshevik coup d'etat had just taken place, bloody and vicious, yet out of the public limelight. All four of the third-generation Rockefeller brothers are now dead, as are others who were close to them. Now America is being dragged along toward revolution, dictatorship, and war by the ad hoc gang of four, Brzezinski, Blumenthal, Brown, and Schlesinger. It was Schlesinger who said in the fall of 1975, quote, some years from now someone will raise the question, Why weren't we warned? And I wanted to be able to say, Indeed you were." Unquote. Now Schlesinger himself is working fast to help bring on the very disasters he warned us about. Can you imagine? Seven months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I spelled out the secret new strategy for an American nuclear first strike against Russia, and as I say these words, more and more parts of that plan are falling rapidly into place. At the same time, the Bolsheviks are trying to schedule coming events to bring on full-scale revolution here as their first priority. Then with a stunned America in their iron grip, they intend to move us quickly into nuclear war with Russia. Already the plan I revealed last August for the Camp David summit to lead to an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty has been accomplished. At the same time, Bolshevik control within the Vatican has brought about the drastic shift of the Roman Catholic Church to a strongly anti-Russian stance. Two Popes, John Paul I and the real John Paul II, were murdered last fall by the Bolsheviks in the process, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTERS No. 39 and 41. The crucial importance of Red China and Iran in the plan I revealed last August has also caused both of them to undergo dramatic developments during the past six months. My friends, we are now at the crossroads. It is do or die for the Satanic Bolsheviks who will never turn back from their suicidal plans. It is also do or die for the survivors of the four Rockefeller brothers, the rest of the Rockefeller family, who are in mortal danger from the Bolsheviks. And my friends, it is do or die for us, for Christianity in the West, and for Western civilization itself. Many people today are now saying, What can I do? After you have heard this recording, you will have my suggestion as to what you can do, and I urge you to act quickly because there is no time to be wasted. My three topics this month are Topic No. 1. The Hoax Reappearance of Dr. Henry Kissinger Topic No. 2. The Impending Collapse of the Chase Manhattan Bank and Topic No. 3. The Egyptian-Israeli Treaty for Nuclear War Topic No. 1. Two months ago on the evening of January 26, the life of Nelson Rockefeller ended abruptly. As I revealed five days later in my AUDIO LETTER No. 42, he was murdered, shot once in the head. Last month I reported that Rockefeller's murder had been only the beginning of a pattern of events. The pattern is that of the Bolshevik Purge, that is, a bloody yet secret coup d'etat. In the space of only a few weeks the secret rulership of the United States changed hands. The coup began on January 26 when, as the Bolsheviks put it, Nelson Rockefeller was liquidated, and by February 17 the coup d'etat had been achieved because by that date both David and Lawrence Rockefeller had also been executed. Meanwhile, the purge had also eliminated several persons who knew too much about Nelson Rockefeller's murder. These included Megan Marshak, Ponchita Pierce, and Rockefeller family spokesman Hugh Morrow but there was one disappearance last month that was not according to the Bolshevik game plan. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 43, 
Dr. Henry Kissinger was to be the key man in the new Bolshevik power group. Kissinger had conspired with others for Nelson Rockefeller's murder and was positioning himself to pick up the reins of Rockefeller power. But on February 5, the private jet carrying Henry and Nancy Kissinger with their five bodyguards from London to the United States disappeared over the North Atlantic. I can now reveal that the Kissinger jet suffered a mid-air explosion. The crippled airplane crashed into the sea at the navigational coordinates 54 degrees, 40 minutes, 57 seconds north, 26 degrees, 40 minutes, 0 seconds west. No one escaped from the plane, the remnants of which sank in approximately 8,000 feet of water. The exact fate of the Kissinger jet was not immediately known last month, but it did soon become obvious that Kissinger was gone for good. As a result, the Bolsheviks here in America were thrown into turmoil. The plans Kissinger had helped set in motion to dispose of the Rockefellers were carried forward. Meanwhile, the ad hoc gang of four emerged as the guiding force of the secret new Bolshevik Revolution here in America. These four men have only a small fraction of the power formerly wielded by the four Rockefeller brothers, but they are very dangerous men indeed. These men are National Security Chief Zbigniew Brzezinski, Treasury Secretary W. Michael Blumenthal, Defense Secretary Harold Brown, and Energy Secretary James Schlesinger. Together they are working feverishly toward a complete takeover of America's industry, banking, agriculture, everything, and beyond that their goal is nuclear war with Russia, an act of national suicide for the rest of us. As of now the Bolshevik coup d'etat, that is, the change in ruling circles, has already been accomplished. What still lies ahead is the full-fledged open revolution to transform American society as a whole into a Bolshevik hell. Using the excuse of a deliberate war crisis in the Middle East and resulting oil shortages, the Bolsheviks plan to start closing down American freedoms in a declared national emergency. From there the Bolshevik grip around our necks will steadily tighten gradually choking and strangling us into total submission. As the last gasp of free air is squeezed from our lungs, the blackness of Bolshevik dictatorship will gather itself around us. Then those who have been content to wait and see will realize too late that it can happen here. In AUDIO LETTER No. 14 I described some of the valuable lessons the four Rockefeller brothers had learned from their clandestine support of Adolf Hitler. One of these lessons was that a revolution is best carried out with, and not against, the full power of a nation's government, and that lesson is not lost on the Bolsheviks here in America, the former allies of the Rockefeller brothers. Using the excuse of crisis conditions, they will use their governmental authority for revolutionary purposes. Businesses large and small will be nationalized as the Bolsheviks take over America's means of production. The banks will be closed, cutting off access of millions of people to their life savings. Both corporate and private farms, ranches, orchards, and vineyards will be taken away from their owners nationwide and collectivized. Engineers of all types will be put to work wherever the government puts them in all-out preparation for war, and the prelude to this is already visible in the job market of today. People without special skills will be herded like cattle from one location to another for agricultural or other tasks, and millions who are troublesome for various reasons will be sent to concentration camps, of which 13 already exist in America in various states of condition. These things, my friends, are what the Bolsheviks, including the new ad hoc gang of four, have in mind for us very soon. All they have to do is to hold on to their present power until the coming Middle East crisis unties their hands. Until then they cannot unleash the dictatorial emergency powers they want, and so they are vulnerable. While they are waiting for their hour to come, 
They know they must not let the American public realize anything about the Bolshevik coup d'etat that has taken place. Last month I revealed intelligence that the disappearances of Henry and Nancy Kissinger, David and Lawrence Rockefeller, and others are all connected to the Bolshevik coup d'etat. So the Bolsheviks dare not let you know that any of these people have dropped out of sight. That is why I said last month, quote, doubles or look-alikes may begin to appear on the scene for these people. What is amazing, especially in the case of Kissinger, is that they have been able to stifle public questions for so long in his absence." Unquote. During the past month or so, the Bolsheviks have been orchestrating a careful campaign using the major media to deceive the American public, and sure enough, doubles are being used as part of this deception campaign. Falsified stories are being planted in the news media, both with and without the knowledge of those who publish the stories. One day it may be just a sentence or two in a society column alleging that Henry Kissinger showed up at a social gathering without saying where or when. A day or two later a different newspaper may print a story alleging that Megan Marshak is looking for a new job here in Washington. The picture that accompanies the story is one of the same old file photos we have been seeing for two months. Several times, however, a double has been used. Then an item appears about Panchita Pierce with a supposedly new photo, but you are not told that the person in the photo is only a look-alike. The real Panchita Pierce is dead of a bullet in the head. And then, of course, once in a while there has to be a low-key item in the news about David Rockefeller. In his case a very good double has been on the job since late February, and he appears occasionally in photos. One example of this took place on February 27 when the David Rockefeller double spoke before the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce. He had never spoken there before and so his audience never suspected that this man was not David Rockefeller. The next day the New York Times ran a brief news item about the talk, complete with a small photograph of the David Rockefeller double at the lectern. But of all the disappearances I revealed last month, by far the most dangerous to the Bolsheviks is that of Dr. Henry Kissinger. For many years Kissinger was highly visible to the American public. Any time a major new development takes place in international relations, Americans expect to see Kissinger giving his comments on television. His name is a household word, and his distinctive face and guttural voice are recognized instantly by millions. These factors would have made Kissinger a great asset to his fellow Bolsheviks if he had lived. But now these very same factors are presenting the Bolsheviks with a difficult problem. Of all the missing persons, it is Kissinger whose prolonged absence from public view would be noticed first by Americans, and yet he is also very difficult to imitate successfully enough to pass the test of prolonged television interviews with close-up shots. And so up to now the use of the double is only a secondary factor in the Bolshevik cover-up of Kissinger's disappearance. In recent weeks a well-tanned double for Kissinger was dispatched to Acapulco, Mexico, to lend credence to the cover story that he was vacationing there. He has also shown up elsewhere, mingling with people who do not know him well, and even speaking to such groups of people. This is the man who was seen momentarily on television three days ago in connection with the signing of the Egyptian-Israeli Treaty in Washington. As the television cameras gave us a brief instant look at this man hugging Egypt's President Sadat, we were told, that's Henry Kissinger." Quote, unquote. In ways like this the Kissinger double is playing an important role now, but the big problem facing the Bolsheviks is the television interview problem, and so far they have not been able to produce a double who is capable of completely solving that problem. So instead 
They have recently concocted a different kind of hoax using the little-known technical tools of television itself. In a moment I will describe in detail how a television hoax has just been perpetrated by the Bolsheviks. The purpose of this hoax is to trick you into believing that Henry Kissinger, after disappearing for over a month, has miraculously reappeared. They will stop at nothing to make you believe this, my friends, because in order to believe that Kissinger is alive, you must disbelieve what I told you last month about his permanent disappearance on February 5. That means you will also disbelieve what I told you about the other secret deaths and disappearances last month, and that means in turn that you will refuse to believe that a Bolshevik coup d'etat has taken place here in America. And so, my friends, you are faced with a clear choice upon which your freedom and your life depend. One choice is to keep your mind open to what I have told you, that Kissinger is dead, and decide whether the fast-growing crisis atmosphere makes sense in that light. Your only other choice is to believe what the Bolsheviks want you to believe, that is, that Kissinger is alive because, quote, I saw him on television, unquote. Your decision about what you believe in this situation is so important that I cannot stress it enough. So before I describe the Kissinger television hoax itself, I believe it is essential that I give you some background for what is going on now. There is nothing new about doubles, hoaxes, and trickery by those who control the mass media. Many people think that a double is an exotic rare occurrence, but actually doubles are relatively easy to find for those who specialize in that field. For example, in Hollywood, California, there is an agency called Celebrity Lookalikes Incorporated run by Ron Smith. The agency provides look-alikes for all kinds of public figures for entertainment purposes. They have over 400 look-alikes, including one for Kissinger, and not one but two look-alikes for Jimmy Carter. One Carter look-alike is named Ed Beeler from Waco, Texas. The other named Walter Hannon is from Los Angeles. Both look so much like Carter that most people can't tell the difference. Not long ago Bob Hope illustrated this fact when he wrote to Ed Beeler, quote, Dear Ed, thanks for bringing the Jimmy Carter look and your talent to NBC for the all-star comedy tribute to Vaudeville Special. May I say your presence was somewhat unnerving. After your appearance on the set, three of the pages left immediately to pay their back taxes." Unquote. But doubles and other hoaxes are not always so entertaining. Since medieval times, doubles have been used as an instrument of intrigue. History is replete with the exploits of impostors who have taken the place of the rich and the powerful, and often they have been remarkably successful. If all of this is new to you, I urge you to do your own library research. For example, one of the latest books on the whole area of hoaxes was published in 1977 by Reader's Digest. It's called the Pleasures of Deception by Norman Moss. Chapter 4 of the book deals with a topic that is specially relevant here, that is hoaxes perpetrated by means of the mass media. It begins, quote, with the creation of the mass media, a whole new area of deception was opened up. This provided the means of fooling the whole public at the same time in the same way. Anything told through the mass media carries credibility. It is more solid than rumor, more respectable than gossip, more believable than hearsay." Unquote. A few lines further on, the author points out that people tend to just swallow what they read, saying, quote, The newspapers say so and so. Unquote. He might have added, quote, I saw it on television. Unquote. The psychological key to all this is explained in the words, quote, This authority stems partly from the fact that the media, and particularly the news media, deal with public issues that are beyond the experience of most of its audience." Unquote. In other words, if we don't know any better, we just believe what we are told. 
Still, you may say, surely the great major media of the United States are not used for really serious distortions. It just couldn't happen here. Well, my friends, it began happening here over 80 years ago. I pointed out on several past occasions that America began selling her soul at the time of the build-up to the Spanish-American War. Spain was dragged into war by the United States, and American public opinion eagerly welcomed the war. The Hearst newspaper chain deliberately whipped up American passions to the point where the cries of Remember the Maine led America into a national crime against Spain. Later on the gross distortions and outright lies by the Hearst media came out publicly, but by then the damage was done, and the American public did not cry out in anger over the trickery nor insist that we make amends to Spain. Instead, we were too puffed up over being suddenly a world power. With that, we began to blind ourselves to the dangers of media lies. It has gotten worse and worse, and we have become more and more blind. The major media have fallen ever more completely under centralized control and have become increasingly powerful and ruthless. In June 1972, a national scandal called Watergate began, and from start to finish it was orchestrated by the controlled major media. The media script to destroy first Vice President Spiro Agnew and then President Richard Nixon was incredibly detailed. For example, beginning early in 1973, I was able to reveal on radio talk shows all over America that the face of Spiro Agnew was scheduled to appear on the covers of Time and Newsweek for the week of August 13, 1973. That was to be the signal for Agnew to be cut down fast by scandal. Everything went off exactly as planned. Agnew did appear on the covers of Time and Newsweek right on schedule, and less than three months later he left office under the cloud of scandal. I have revealed more about the Watergate scandal in the past, and there's no time to review all of that again now. The point is this. The controlled major media of the United States have proven themselves to be powerful enough to bring on a war or to end a presidency, and now they are under the control of the International Bolsheviks, the most diabolical, crafty, and ruthless people ever to stalk the earth. Regardless of the other details, their schemes always have one key ingredient in common, that is, to instill trust in their intended victims until the moment of vicious attack. And that, my friends, is what they are trying to do to you now by means of their television hoax about Henry Kissinger's seeming reappearance. The Kissinger television hoax began early this month, March 1979. My AUDIO LETTER No. 43 had been recorded on February 28 and began reaching subscribers the first few days of this month. Within days the Bolsheviks began their counterattack in an effort to discredit what I had revealed about Kissinger's disappearance. As a preliminary step, an interview of Kissinger was shown on the NBC Today Show of March 9. Jimmy Carter was then in the midst of his trip to Egypt and Israel and the topic of the NBC interview with Kissinger was the Middle East, and yet Kissinger made no reference to the Carter trip then underway. Instead, he spoke in generalities that were months out of date. Many viewers all over the United States recognized the interview segment as having been shown before by NBC, and many stations received complaining telephone calls about it. But the Today Show episode was only a stopgap measure. The master hoax took place just four days ago on the NBC television interview program Meet the Press. My friends, the history of Meet the Press is like the story of America's entire network of major media news sources in miniature. Meet the Press was started as a radio show here in Washington in the late 40s by my friend of 30 years, Martha Roundtree. As a highly intelligent woman and a real patriot, Martha Roundtree ran Meet the Press in such a way that it truly informed Americans with all sides of an issue. But in the late 50s 
she was pressured into selling Meet the Press, which quickly lost its former award-winning quality. Meanwhile, she found herself systematically blackballed from introducing any fresh news programs anywhere in the broadcast media. Just as happened to me a decade later, Martha Roundtree was discriminated against and locked out. And just as I am doing now, she has for some time been informing Americans as best she can by other means. For those who would like to know more, you may write to her at Leadership Foundation, Box 1720, Washington, D.C., Zip 20013. Her current project is called quote, Proposition 1, The Great Awakening, and it is a program to restore the moral and spiritual values to our nation. You can receive a free brochure about it if you will enclose a stamped, self-addressed business envelope with your letter. Returning to Meet the Press, Control recently passed to NBC itself. Unlike individual radio and television stations, the networks are completely unregulated by the FCC. Now Meet the Press has joined other network programming as a vehicle of propaganda answerable to no one. This past Sunday, March 25, NBC fed a Meet the Press program to affiliated stations nationwide, featuring Henry Kissinger as the guest. And my friends, that was the real Henry Kissinger answering questions. But in exactly the same way, the real Clark Gable was also seen on television recently in Gone with the Wind. Both men looked alive on television, but in actuality both men are dead. But, my friends, the Meet the Press program of last Sunday was much more than a mere rerun of an old tape. It was carefully doctored so that Kissinger appeared to be answering new and up-to-date questions. When you hear how it was done, I believe you will understand why there were so many strange things about that program, and you will also see that NBC went to a great deal of trouble to produce an artificial and falsified edition of Meet the Press last Sunday. It had only one purpose, and that was to deceive you. I now continue with Topic No. 1. Under his million-dollar-a-year contract with NBC, Kissinger was periodically taping interviews to be kept on hand for instant use whenever they might prove useful. All of Kissinger's answers that you saw and heard last Sunday were taped over two months ago on Saturday, January 20, 1979, but that session was not shown the next day on Meet the Press. Instead, the guest that day was Leonard Woodcock, newly designated Ambassador to Red China. The footage you saw last Sunday of the panelists on Meet the Press was taped early that same morning, March 25. Each of the four panelists asked questions which were designed to fit Kissinger's answers of two months ago. In addition, several scenes were shot using a look-alike to be used at commercial breaks and at the end. In these brief scenes, the panel were seen on the left of your screen facing the alleged Kissinger on the right, and as you may have noticed, the Kissinger stand-in sat as still as a zombie in those scenes without saying a word. Finally, computerized videotape editing techniques were used to splice together the new questions, Kissinger's old answers, and the break scenes. The net result was Meet the Press for March 25, 1979, a television hoax by NBC. The March 25 Meet the Press hoax preceded by only one day the signing of the so-called Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty here in Washington. The treaty is the end product of a process begun by Kissinger's own famous shuttle diplomacy, so the treaty should have been a prominent topic among the questions, and yet the fact is that not one single question was asked about the treaty. No one asked Kissinger the obvious question, what do you think of the treaty? Instead, the illusion of an up-to-date program was conveyed by means of clever wording of questions by the two NBC representatives, Bill Monroe and Richard Valeriani. 
In each case a passing reference to the treaty was made in the course of asking about something else, such as the perennial West Bank problem, and during the entire program Kissinger himself used the word treaty only in two brief sentences. These were edited into the beginning of the program for maximum psychological effect, but they said only what Kissinger began saying over six months ago that we will be better off with a treaty than without one. The two NBC representatives dominated the program, asking 12 out of the total of 21 questions, and except for the deceptive references to a treaty, quote unquote, the entire program was strangely out of date. For example, one question about the Middle East had to do with the prospects after Begin leaves office. With Begin here in Washington in triumph for the treaty signing, such a question was ridiculous. But two months ago, when Kissinger was taped, rumors were widespread that Begin might resign shortly. Likewise, one question about Nicaragua, of all things, was of current interest two months ago, but today even the questions about Iran were two months behind the times. There was not one word about the so-called Khomeini Government of today. Instead, the questions and Kissinger's answers revolved around the fall of the Shah and who was to blame for it. When Kissinger was taped on January 20, those questions were right up to date because the Shah had just left Iran only four days earlier on January 16. But who is talking about the Shah today? My friends, what is most revealing about last Sunday's Meet the Press hoax is what was not asked. Kissinger played a key role in opening America's doors to Red China, yet there was not a word about the visit here by Dong Xiaoping last month. There was a flashback question about Kissinger's role years ago in regard to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Chile, yet China's just completed border war with Vietnam was not even mentioned. We have heard stories for weeks that Kissinger was vacationing in Mexico last month, yet Kissinger was asked nothing to shed light on the hostile reception Jimmy Carter received there last month. And strangest of all, there was not a word to acknowledge Kissinger's alleged terrible grief over the death of Nelson Rockefeller. In the dream world of last Sunday's Meet the Press hoax, it was as if none of these things had ever happened, and that is only natural, my friends, because when Kissinger was taped on January 20, they had not happened yet. Kissinger did not even have the impressive tan he was supposed to have gotten in Mexico. Instead, he appeared pale and unusually nervous. The nervousness, my friends, was due to the fact that on January 20, Kissinger knew that his own conspiratorial activities would lead to the murder of Nelson Rockefeller only six days later. My friends, the Meet the Press hoax was an act of desperation by the Bolsheviks. They want desperately for you to swallow it whole, to say, of course Kissinger is alive. I saw him on television. If you do that, you will be your own worst enemy in the Bolshevik game plan. They cannot keep up this charade for very long, but they are only playing for time and not much time at that. Timetables have slipped before, but the Bolshevik target date to start shutting down our freedoms is the middle of May, only six weeks from now, and after the Bolshevik death grip is around our throats, they could not care less if we then realize that we have been tricked, because then it will be too late. Topic No. 2. For hundreds of years devils, lookalikes, and impostors have been recurring fact of life throughout modern civilization. Where the rich and the powerful and the ruling classes are involved, the pattern is always the same. Quoting once again from the book I cited earlier, The Pleasures of Deception, quote, A monarch or heir to the throne dies. 
but in circumstances which leave the possibility of doubting that he really did die, at least to those who want to doubt it, and claimants come forward." Unquote. When one considers the enormous empire which the late four Rockefeller brothers presided over, the attractions for impostors are overwhelming, and there is no need to resort to confidential information to recognize this much. For example, you might look over the book titled The Rockefellers by Peter Collier and David Horowitz, published in 1976 by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston. It reveals such a major role in history and such family wealth that anyone who could get control of it all would put themselves in a very powerful position. The plunderers would gain not only the wealth and assets, but the power that goes with controlling the dynasty's fortune. If the heads of the dynasty were to vanish from the scene without this becoming widely known, the way would be open for doubles and impostors to enter the picture. The whole empire could be taken over without eliminating anyone except the very closest associates of those who had secretly disappeared. Last month I revealed that the Rockefeller family empire has now been placed in exactly this vulnerable condition. All four of the third generation Rockefeller brothers have been killed in a Bolshevik coup d'etat behind the scenes, and the deaths of the last two, David on February 9 and Lawrence on February 17, are being kept secret. Even the surviving members of the Rockefeller family who know about it, the widows and the members of the fourth generation, are keeping quiet about it. As I mentioned last month, they have been led to believe wrongly that silence is in their own best interest, and so the plundering of the Rockefeller family fortune is now underway in earnest. On one hand, the Bolshevik purge of those who were closest to the Four Brothers is continuing. The most conspicuous case of this lately was the murder of Dr. John Knowles, President of the Rockefeller Foundation, early this month on March 6. He was shot in the head. At the same time, doubles for David Rockefeller are now playing an important role in the Bolshevik plundering of the Rockefeller family fortune. Ironically, the most vulnerable part of the whole Rockefeller financial complex is its heart, the mammoth Chase Manhattan Bank. For many years the late David Rockefeller was preoccupied with manipulating the worldwide tentacles of the Rockefeller cartel. One day he would be somewhere in the United States presiding over a meeting to coordinate the actions of huge multinational corporations. Next it might be a rush trip by private jet to the Middle East to patch up some problem there. For example, when David Rockefeller got word that his brother Nelson was dead on January 26, he was in Oman pressuring the Bank of Oman to stop buying gold. Had he not returned here for that emergency, his next stop might have been Singapore or Tokyo. On and on it went, always on the move. The world was David Rockefeller's oyster, and he all but ignored the pearl at the center, his own Chase Manhattan Bank. His constant travels made David Rockefeller a stranger in his own bank in recent years. He was so seldom there, and thereby without realizing it he developed a fatal weakness in his pattern of behavior. Like his brother Nelson, David Rockefeller had been subjected to psychological profile studies without his knowledge. And as with Nelson, David's weakness was discovered. He was not minding the store, that is, the Chase Manhattan Bank. As I mentioned last month, the closest associates of David Rockefeller would not be fooled for long in an intimate meeting with a double, but those close associates, my friends, are scattered worldwide. They are not found at Chase Manhattan Bank. And so the David Rockefeller doubles are using the bank itself as the open sesame to plunder the Rockefeller family riches. Obeying instructions, they are ordering the transfer of tremendous sums of money out of Chase Manhattan Bank and into Bolshevik coffers here and abroad. Meanwhile they are keeping up the image of the late David Rockefeller by darting around on quick trips here and there. In this they are being assisted by Bolshevik agents 
within the fabric of the Rockefeller network of banks, businesses, and publications. By means of the David Rockefeller doubles and other actions, the Bolsheviks are working like a swarm of termites, eating away the assets of Chase Manhattan Bank from within. Other banks here and abroad, too, are being affected by this process. Already Columbia University in New York has begun dumping millions of dollars' worth of bank stocks, including that of Chase Manhattan. And in the portent of things to come, a subsidiary of Chase Manhattan Bank has just filed for bankruptcy. When Chase Manhattan itself collapses, it will have staggering consequences for the banking system of the entire world. Last month I revealed the beginning of the plundering of the Rockefeller family fortune. At that time the Rockefeller fourth generation members did not know what was afoot. Now they do know, but are at a loss of what to do about it. The four third generation brothers always kept tight control over the Rockefeller empire. As a result, the fourth generation Rockefellers were always left in the dark about what the brothers were up to and without any control over their own assets. But I believe now is the time to remind the fourth generation members of the Rockefeller family and also the third generation widows of the one time when they did exert their collective muscle and make it stick. I am referring to the June 1974 conclave of 84 members of the Rockefeller family. The top item on the agenda for that conclave was to answer the question, What shall we do about Dr. Beter? The four brothers, John D. III, Nelson, Lawrence, and David, argued that I should be taken care of quote, unquote, before I could become well enough known to be dangerous to their plans. Two months earlier I had testified before Congress about the missing gold at Fort Knox. The brothers had easily prevented Congress from investigating my charges, but now I was going public with the story. The brothers did not admit that my charges were true in the conclave, only that they were dangerous, and they urged that I be silenced quickly by whatever means. But my friends, the fourth generation said no. The brothers were told in no uncertain terms that the fourth generation would have no part in such a plan. As a result, the brothers decided instead simply to ignore me, to force me off the radio talk shows of which I had been appearing, and to let me say whatever I wanted since I would be denied an audience. My friends, over the past several years I've been asked countless times, Why are you alive? My basic answer is that I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to protect me, and He has done so. But one of the concrete examples of that protection was the action taken nearly five years ago by the fourth generation Rockefellers. So if you have ever wondered why I have always made such a sharp distinction between the four Rockefeller brothers and the rest of the family, now you know. In all likelihood they saved my life. Now I would like to repay them if only they will listen. If they will meet once again in conclave, they will discover that there are concrete steps by which they can retake control of what remains of the Rockefeller Empire for the good of all Americans. As I explained last month, the interests of the surviving members of the Rockefeller family are now identical with those of all patriotic Americans. And so if they will seize this brief opportunity now, they can not only save what remains of their own assets, but more importantly, help save America. My friends, the Rockefeller survivors have a golden opportunity now to redeem themselves in the family name. By acting now they can truly become the benefactors of society which their forebears only pretended to be. But I must add this final observation as well. If the Rockefellers do not take courage and act as I have said, history shows clearly what their fate will be. Whenever the heads of a dynasty are overthrown or killed, those responsible always seek out and kill all survivors to make sure the dynasty can never 
rise again. That is what the Bolsheviks have in store for the entire Rockefeller family if they do not now act to prevent it. Topic No. 3 Three days ago, on March 26, 1979, the Washington air was filled with the promises of peace, peace that always paved the way for war. Shortly before noon that day, Egypt's President Sadat and Israel's Prime Minister Begin joined Jimmy Carter on the lawn of the White House. In a dramatic open-air ceremony, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was signed. Then Sadat and Begin each spoke in glowing terms about achieving, after 30 years of hostility, peace between Egypt and Israel. Even Mrs. Sadat and Mrs. Begin had their turn, side by side at the microphones. Echoing the feelings of wives and mothers everywhere, Mrs. Sadat spoke of the blessings of no longer having to look forward to more war, suffering, and death, and in a display of pure joy she abruptly leaned over and embraced Mrs. Begin. That same afternoon, with the ink barely dry on the so-called peace treaty, the Carter Administration quietly signed two separate agreements with Israel. In one agreement the United States has now given Israel an unconditional guarantee that it will receive all the oil it needs for the next 15 years. This agreement means that Israel will be completely unaffected by the coming destruction of Middle Eastern oil fields, and it is to remain in force no matter how severe the rationing will become here in America. The other agreement or Memorandum of Understanding pledges the United States to go to war against Egypt should the treaty break down. Egypt was not warned in advance about this second American-Israeli agreement and has reacted as if she had been betrayed, which she was. Meanwhile, Israel's Prime Minister Begin has been gloating over this agreement in public, calling it, quote, a beautiful document, well written, and what it contains is very important." Unquote. My friends, what we are seeing now is the culmination of the late Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy of three and four years ago. In AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975, I explained what the Sinai Accord was all about. It consisted of a pair of treaties, one between the United States and Israel, the other between the United States and Egypt and the purpose of the Sinai Accord was to lay the groundwork for a Middle East war that would involve the United States. As I said then, the Middle East war plan was to involve a limited nuclear strike against Arab OPEC oil wells jointly by the United States and Israel. Since I first revealed this basic plan over three years ago, events have caused it to be delayed and revised several times, but now it is moving along fast as part of the Bolsheviks' game plan. They want to use the coming Middle East crisis to shut down America in a Bolshevik revolution before going to war against Russia. And right now cadres of Bolsheviks are pouring into the United States, most all of them experienced in revolution tactics and strategy. Shortly before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the ruling circles of the United States sent more than 1,500 of these people to Russia to foment revolution. Now they are returning to do the same thing here in the United States. Beginning with the strange death of John D. Rockefeller III eight months ago, control of America began shifting rapidly to these Satanic Bolsheviks. And last August 1978, in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, I was able to reveal their master strategy to build up to a nuclear first strike against Russia. It's a prescription for up to 350 million people to die worldwide, all to no avail. But it's do or die for the Bolsheviks. They would rather have all of us die than to give up their own dreams of total world domination. And the key to this catastrophic plan lies in igniting the long-delayed Middle East War. We have already been given a sample of what lies ahead for us in the Jonestown, Guyana tragedy. Four months ago 
I devoted AUDIO LETTER No. 40 in its entirety to the military operation that took place there and the role played in that operation by the mass murder. As I revealed then, Israeli commandos were the key to the success of the operation. It wiped out the secret Russian missile base I began warning about over four years ago. My friends, the joint American-Israeli operation in Guyana was only a dress rehearsal for the coming joint American-Israeli limited nuclear strike against Saudi Arabian oil fields. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I explained how the plan was to begin with a supposedly surprise success in the Camp David talks last September. The goal was to be an eventual treaty between Egypt and Israel set up in such a way as to drag in the United States. And now this situation is a fact, and the Hate Saudi Arabia campaign is also far advanced, right on track as I reviewed it in AUDIO LETTER No. 41. Soon a major manufactured incident in the Middle East will scuttle the peace treaty. The ensuing nuclear destruction of Saudi Arabia's oil fields will give the rulers of both Israel and the United States what they want. Freed of any concern about her own oil supplies, Israel will be free to destroy the engine of Arab economic power, oil revenues, and the resultant cutoff of oil supplies will give our Bolshevik rulers here in America the excuse to shut down our freedoms under the guise of a national emergency. Quickly then they plan to bring us all under total regimentation as America gradually shifts onto a full war footing. My friends, the time left to us is very short, and yet there is one last chance left if we will take it. The rulers of Russia today are Christians. Right now the actor Pope who masquerades as the dead Pope John Paul II is preparing to create trouble in Poland. By contrast, Russia has just invited over 200 Polish priests into Russia to begin opening monasteries, schools, and churches there. Two years ago I began asking, where are the churches in this hour of need? I urge now that American church leaders at all levels and from all denominations band together for a pilgrimage for peace to Moscow. Pastors and other church leaders who want life and freedom for America instead of death and destruction can do this for our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I urge you to call my business number here in Washington, D.C., Area Code 202-659-3999. Give me your name, address, telephone number, and what your church position is so that you can be contacted later. My friends, it's up to you to make sure Christian leaders and church leaders all over America hear this message in time to respond by April 30, 1979. When I record AUDIO LETTER No. 45 next month, God willing, I plan to tell you whether or not American church leaders have responded in great enough numbers to rise to this occasion. If that takes place and a massive pilgrimage of church leaders can be formed to visit the Kremlin leaders, perhaps they can be convinced that the Bolsheviks have not infiltrated all of our churches. And if that is true, perhaps we can turn aside the Bolshevik war plan. But if church leaders here do not respond, Russia's leaders will continue to believe as they do now. They are convinced that what happened to the Russian Orthodox Church 60 years ago has now happened to the churches here in America. And if that is true, then God help us all. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you. And may God bless each and every one of you.